gonna do some sprints. You ready? Why are you running? Why are you running? You know, I never really understood exactly why this movie existed. When I was younger, it just didn't make sense to me. Why am I supposed to give a shit about these four watered-down versions of pre-existing and well-established characters? And then I remembered, Maleficent came out a year before this movie. I am 100% confident in saying that this movie only exists because Maleficent came out and then people remembered Maleficent even existed, and then Disney Channel wanted to get on that hype train. Okay, I mean, to be fair though, the theory itself is a little more than flimsy. Descendants apparently started production sometime in 2013 and Maleficent had quite a lengthy production process, so it's not really fair to make that assumption. But my personal headcanon is that Descendants was only made to sell more Maleficents. <laughs> Disney Channel's Descendants originally premiered on the Disney Channel on July 31st, 2015 to 6.6 million viewers. For those of you who don't remember how popular cable television used to be at its peak, I want to remind you that this is a metric ton of viewers, even back then. It also had 10.5 million DVR playbacks shortly after the movie's release, which basically just meant that people had recorded it and watched it back after the movie had already aired. I feel like I don't really need to explain that, but some of my viewers are apparently as young as 13, and it's so weird to think about that. I'm getting old. The movie was also received quite well. I mean, it's above average for a Disney Channel original movie, so we'll cut it some slack on that front, but it wasn't exactly winning any Golden Globes. It did, however, win an award for the Writers and Directors Guild for 2016. Seriously, don't ask me how this happened, I'm just gonna take it at face value and I expect you to do the same. This movie was also a career starter for like, half of the main cast. I mean, not Cameron Boyce because his career started in 2010 with the hit films Grown Ups. I also do think we need to touch on the unfortunate fact that Cameron Boyce's career was cut pretty short. Cameron Boyce was on track to do a lot with his life, and it's really unfortunate that he had to go too soon. But in my opinion, Cameron Boyce's legacy kind of lives on in Descendants more than any other Disney Channel product, and I honestly don't think that's a bad thing at all. Descendants 3 was the first of five products to release after the death of Cameron, the others being Wicked Woods, Mrs. Flesher, Runt, and Paradise City. I can't say I've seen or even heard of any of those, but to be honest, I kind of feel like I have to talk about it. I loved Cameron Boyce as a kid, and honestly, I really, really miss him. He was also my first male celebrity crush as a kid, so maybe that's why. I don't know what it was, but his freckles did something to me as a kid. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have Gov Cameron, who was my straight crush as a kid, and I wouldn't say that this movie really did much for her acting career. I think she kind of took off with Liv and Maddie, and to be fair, I'm not the biggest fan of her acting anyway, but I do respect that Dove Cameron was able to do what Adam Sandler was able to do at 45, at a third of his age. But the Descendants movies skyrocketed her singing career without a doubt. She really does have a wonderful voice, and I'm happy that this movie existed to put it on display. This is all to say that I respect Descendants as a movie, but I'm still very excited to rip into this movie satirically for the next 25 to 30 minutes. So without further ado, let's get into that. I like the opening for Descendants, I'm not gonna lie, but I mean it's weird to me that it takes place on an Android tablet, but I think it's a pretty creative and fresh idea. Also, the animated logo opening is actually really satisfying to look at for some reason. It becomes very clear very quickly that the plot of this movie is either about to be about racism or eugenics. Because after Belle and the Beast got married, they put all the evil people on an island without magic, Wi-Fi, or a way out the island as it's surrounded by a magic barrier. And judging by the fact that three of our four main characters are people of color, I feel like this is about to be a race thing. Also, Dove Cameron says this. This is my hood. And it made me just a little bit uncomfortable. The first character we're formally introduced to is Ben Florian, played by Mitchell Hope, who is about to be crowned king of the United States of Oridon at 16 years old, while the current king, who is his father, is still alive and well. What? What reason could they possibly have to make this living pencil topper of a person be the king of a country at 16 years old? Next we meet the king and queen of Oradon, the beauty and the beast. They're not really interesting characters in this movie. If you want to know what they're like, just Google happy white couple stock photo, and that's pretty much just it. There is nothing interesting about their characters whatsoever. Ben's first proclamation as king is to end segregation. I'm starting to see why I got so many comments on my Disney Zombies video telling me why Descendants is so similar to that movie. I'll avoid 
avoid going too deep into it now, but this is already starting to seem like the white savior trope that was pretty problematic in that movie. Ben wants to take some of the kids from the Isle of the Lost and give them a chance to live on Oridon. The dad is naturally against this, but thankfully the mom reminds him that his whole life is one big second chance. So the king listens to Ben list the parents of the children who they want to bring over. Those being the children of Cruella de Vil, Jafar, the evil queen, and Maleficent. Although the dad is very avidly against this, and for very, very good reason, he ends up agreeing because Ben says pretty please. And the dad just can't say no to those puppy dog eyes. I should be taking much more away from this scene, but I'm stupid and I keep laughing at the fact that the dad said Among Us. Among Us. After that scene concludes, we're introduced to our main characters via song. Now, although I think this song is good, the incredible amount of audio processing in the song makes the lip syncing feel so obvious. And of course, it's a musical, it's gonna be noticeable, but all of their voices have like two layers of autotune on them, which makes it feel more unnatural than most of the songs in Zombies did. But the song is at least enjoyable. Also, all of these kids are just dicks. They commit several crimes throughout this song, and this song literally ends with the purple hair girl, and I'm not making this up, stealing candy from a baby. I mean, come on, man, what the baby do to deserve that? After the song, however, we're introduced to purple haired girl's mother, Maleficent, played by Kristen Chenoweth. I like her character a lot, actually. Maleficent's whole thing in this movie is that she's over dramatically evil, and it's honestly a lot of fun. I can't even pretend to hate it. But then we learned that the daughter's name is Mal? which is short for Maleficent. And according to the wiki, her last name is Bertha. Yeah. She really got set up for failure with that name. It's also weird because Maleficent doesn't even canonically have a last name, but Mal does? Moving along from that though, Maleficent has shown up to deliver the news to Mal and her friends that they no longer have to go to school in the ghetto. And they will now be attending school at Oridon. Although they're initially excited and then not excited, they land on being kinda sorta on board with the idea because Maleficent wants them to steal the fairy godmother's magic wand. After that conversation ends, we're introduced to the rest of the main characters and their parents. The evil queen, who is played by Kathy Najimy, who is obsessed with being beautiful. Cruella Deville, who is played by Wendy Raquel Robinson, who is black now, but she's actually very well cast, so it doesn't really matter. And lastly, Jafar, played by Maj Jabrani. I like him, but his appearance confuses me. He's kinda dressed like any non-denominational Middle Eastern guy. Like, he doesn't even have Jafar's classic beard, nor does he even wear anything that seems to even slightly resemble any of his iconic look. They seriously just gave him a turban and called it a day. Don't worry, we'll talk about the teenagers in a second. This scene is clearly meant to set more up about the parents than it is the kids themselves. Maleficent also gives Mal a spell book before the school limo comes to pick up the kids. Looks like we have a few minutes and nothing important happening, so let's finally introduce our main characters. Firstly is Evie Grimhilda, daughter of the Evil Queen. Played by Sophia Carson, Evie immediately comes off as the sweetest of the bunch. Next up is Jay, played by Nils Allen Stewart Jr., or more commonly and considerably shorter, Boo Boo Stewart. He's the son of Jafar and the only one of the main characters to canonically not have a last name. His whole thing is that he's a kleptomaniac who steals anything that he can get his grubby little hands on. Seriously, no one saw this shit. And lastly is Carlos Deville, played by Cameron Boyce. He kinda just exists to prove that this movie isn't just for girls. After arriving at Oridon High and immediately making a scene... Oh my god, seriously, this is why we can't take black people anywhere. We're introduced to the fairy godmother, played by Melanie Paxson, the headmistress of Oridon Prep School. Evie introduces herself to Ben as Princess Evie, and Audrey takes that personally. Audrey is played by Sarah Jeffrey, and is the daughter of the Sleeping Beauty and Prince Philip. Audrey says that Evie has no royal status on the island of Oridon, but that's simply not how royal status works. She has no power, but she's still technically a princess whether or not she's in Oridon, on the Island of the Lost, or in a other fictional place like Memphis. Ben seems like a good guy and is genuinely interested in getting to know all of the main characters. Some better than others. But Audrey is a big fan of generational racism and constantly reminds the group of their father's sins. Next, we're introduced to Doug, played by Zachary Gibson, the son of Dopey of the Seven Dwarves. He's a nice character, but I'm a little hung up on the fact that this means that oh. Dopey canonically f***s, and I'm not okay with that. 
This is apparently a behavior he hopes to repeat with Evie, given the fact that he jizzed in his band attire at the mere sight of her. Everyone seems to be settling into their new dorms except for Mal, who is dead set on the fact that the gang needs to be proving themselves to their parents. So they use Evie's pocket-sized magic mirror to locate exactly where the fairy godmother's wand is, only to find out that it's in a museum that's only two miles away. Which proves to be a light jog for these guys because they literally make their way there in a jump cut. Seriously, that's a 20 minute run for most people and they didn't even break a sweat in all of the leather attire that they're wearing. Mal uses her spell book to make the security officer fall asleep and then uses it again to make this door open. What the f*** are these ultra specific spells? The gang comes across this room with statues of their parents, which is only odd to me because why is it only these four specifically? Are there only four evil people to ever exist? I'd imagine not because this movie did get two sequels. Oh. Maleficent does this somehow. I'm sure that Mal is just imagining this, but given that this movie is about magic, I'm sure this is some sh that Maleficent could do with some magic. Regardless, I don't really care because we get a really good song here. Like this sh goes insanely hard. You know, it's funny because they probably wrote this movie after realizing that villain songs always go hard, so they just wanted to do that for 110 minutes. But the song is just here to further reinforce the fact that Mal really wants to live up to her mother's legacy. After the song ends, the gang manages to find the wand, but because Jay is stupid and does the exact thing that Mal tells him not to do, he gets his ass beat by a forced field and an alarm goes off and the kids have to make a quick exit. Carlo stops to make this phone call and turns off this alarm too. This is weird to me because it's not like Carlos is a good guy or anything. It's not like all the main characters are secretly good people under their seemingly rough exteriors or anything. <laughs> Hey, wait a sec. The next day, the kids are attending kindness class or some other random made up class and we're introduced to Jane, the daughter of the fairy godmother. I was gonna make a joke about these two being a cute couple, but then I realized, wait a second, that would be weird as because Cameron Boyce was 15 when this movie was filmed. Which is weird to me because you have to remember the fact that Dove Cameron would be 18 when this movie was filmed, Boo Boo Carson would be 20, and Sophia Carson would be 19. I never really thought about it too much until this exact moment, but Cameron looks like a baby in comparison to all of these other actors. Because relatively speaking, he is. He's literally four years younger than most of his co-stars. Ben's actor was also 18 at the time of filming, and so was Audrey's. So if you're wondering why he looks like a fetus compared to everyone else who was supposedly in the same grade as him, there's your answer as to why. Shortly thereafter, the boys go to play a game called Tourney, which is a game where the objective is seemingly to cause as much physical harm to your opponent as is legally allowed, while still getting balls and goals. This display of raw, visceral, and concerning violence impresses the coach, and he immediately puts Jay on the team. Ben totally doesn't flirt with Mal in this scene, but Mal is more interested in the fact that Jane walked by and goes to chase her down into a bathroom. Mal tries to seduce her, I mean befriend her. Mal befriends Jane by using magic to change her hair. This is because Maleficent seemingly killed all of the hairstylists that previously resided in Oridon. Jane then somewhat depressingly asks Mal to fix her nose next, like she isn't already one of the prettiest people I've ever seen. But Mal persuades Jane into getting the fairy godmother to use her wand to give her daughter a rhinoplasty. That sounds really morally concerning, but it doesn't matter because the scene is now over and we get to watch Evie thirst over this guy in her chemistry class. Class. Here we meet Chad Charming. Seriously, this guy's name is literally f Chad. I feel like I should write a joke here, but I think it already wrote itself. The important part of the scene is that Evie uses her magic mirror to find the atomic weight of silver. This to me seriously seems like a gross misuse of magic power, but I'll allow it for now. But this gives Chad Thundercock the balls to put the moves on Evie because there's nothing hotter than a woman who knows how to solve for the atomic weight of any given atom. Carlos begins to train for his next tourney game, but when a dog shows up, those strong black jeans kick in and he uses his latent negro speed to get away from this dog. Carlos gets to meet this dog, who is named Dude, and Carlos gets over his fear of dogs that his mother has instilled in him since birth. Evie meets up with Chad under the bleachers and they do a little bit of flirting, or whatever the hell this is an excuse for, and Chad asks Evie to do all of his homework for him, because Evie's display earlier put him under the impression that she has any intelligence of her own. In this same scene, Doug also asks out Evie, but she just walks away. Bro did not deserve that. 
Apparently Jane and Mal just casually hang out now, but in this scene we're introduced to Lonnie. Played by Diane Doan, she's the daughter of Fa Mulan and Lee Shang. Yes, she is perfect in every way, shape, and form, and no, I will not be taking second opinions. She's looking to pay Mal for a new haircut, and wow, I'm sorry, but this is a major downgrade. It's not even that it looks bad, it's that the only thing that she specifies that she wants is cool hair. This is not cool hair. This is what a soccer mom would get when she has to be at her daughter's dance recital and then be at her husband's business dinner 30 minutes later. In the next scene, it's apparent that the group is running low on ideas of how to get the magic wand. But at the same time, Ben shows up at the door and Mal learns that Ben's girlfriend is one of the only people who gets to stand next to the fairy godmother at his coronation. So Mal hatches a plan to make a love potion so that Mal can be Ben's girlfriend and hopefully get close enough to the fairy godmother so that she can snatch the wand. But while making the love potion that night, there's a problem and the group needs a human tear. But just at that moment, Lonnie comes in to find the group and tells Mal that most of the girls at the school want their hair redone. Lonnie ends up talking about how good her life is because she got to have chocolate chip cookies as a kid, and it is now said out loud that none of the villains even love their kids, which makes Lonnie cry the single thug tear that they need. I have a hard time believing that Jafar doesn't love Jay though. Jafar genuinely seemed happy that his kid got to go to a nice school. Everyone else is pretty easily a victim of child neglect though. Jay asks Mal if this is what they really want to do because things aren't so bad for them where they are, which makes Jay the first person in this movie to officially convert religions. Jay also flirts with all of these girls, and I can't tell if it's because he's actually hot or because of none of these girls have ever seen a brown person before. Mal ends up manipulating Ben into eating one of the chocolate chip and love spell cookies that she made. But it seems that the ecstasy that Mal gave Ben worked, and he now wants nothing more than to start a nuclear family with Mal. At the next tourney game, Jay forces Carlos to play, but because this is a movie, they end up playing near perfectly. This part is wildly unnecessary though, like, I mean sick flex, but that was just extra. Because Ben is still Still bouncing off the perk 45s, he steals the microphone and announces that he loves Mao. He even starts to sing a whole musical number and... Why is the music in this movie so damn good? I'm supposed to be the angry, over-analytical, somewhat cynical, funny adult who complains about kids' movies, but this shit is just straight up fire. Seriously, the song is actually a 9.5 out of 10 from me. The only problem that I have with it is that the audio sounds a bit odd at some times. It sounds as if the audio was recorded in an empty room with a low-grade microphone and was upscaled after the fact. None of the other songs have this weird audio quirk, and it sounds like this on Spotify too, so I don't really know what this is about. Audrey decides to date Chad to get back at Mal, which upsets Evie, and Mal and Ben are officially going to the coronation together, and Jay wins the MVP award for the school's tourney team. The next day in class, Evie gets her magic mirror confiscated after Chad snitches about the fact that she has it. Boom. You looking for this? But the teacher says that if she can pass the test without using it, then she must not have ever been cheating, not even once. So after class is over, she goes to tell Doug that she passed the test. Evie is now magically into Doug because he doesn't see her as just a pretty face, and she says this, Well, maybe we can get together and we'll hang out here. Yeah, let's get together which probably just made this guy's whole decade. But Mal has to steal Evie away because Ben asked Mal on a date and Mal needs Evie's help getting ready for it. Mal asks Evie if she's ever afraid of her mom and she hesitates to answer, but I wanna make it incredibly clear. If your child answers anything but no instantaneously, you've probably done something wrong. Fear and respect very rarely exist within one person in regard to another. Ben comes to pick up Mal and he takes her on a magical bike ride through the not so enchanted forest. We also learn that Mal's middle name is Bertha. Wait, so she has a middle name but not a last name? That makes no sense. You can't have a middle name if you don't have a last name because it's not in the middle of anything. At that point, Bertha is just your last name. Also, why is she divulging this information to a guy she doesn't even give two shits about? She's apparently never told anybody her middle name up until this very moment, so why tell the guy that is now spellbound to loving you unconditionally anyway? You could break this nigga's Xbox and he'd probably thank you for it. Ben takes Mal for a picnic, which she seems to be enjoying, whether or not she wants to admit it, which I guess is the effect of a basic white jock. Ben also tells Mal that he doesn't think that good and evil are genetic traits, but rather they're traits of personality. Wow, get this kid a psych degree, because he's the only person in this universe who has a basic understanding of behavioral and humanistic psychology. Mel gorges on some strawberries, and Ben apparently packs some swim trunks and goes for a quick swim. Mal begins to sing a song about 
the excruciating moral dilemma she's experiencing right now, because apparently she doesn't know who she is and is now in love with Ben, even though she has shown zero interest in this guy until about three minutes ago. I'd also like to remind you and her that he doesn't actually love her, she literally drugged him to have feelings for her. The song is kind of mid also, not amazing but far from terrible, but to be fair I'm not a fan of slow songs so I'm kind of biased against it. After fighting a seven year war on her mind about whether or not she's evil, she begins to wonder where Ben is. I would also be wondering where Ben is if I were singing in a Disney Channel original movie and I didn't have anyone to back up sing or dance for me. She searches for him in the water and then begins to drown? Ben realizes that Mal can't swim and stops playing peekaboo and goes to save her. Girl, what are you coughing for? Your head never even went below the water. Ben asks Mal if she loves him, but Mal says she doesn't know what love feels like. This is because she's never been to an olive garden, because when you're there, you're family. <laughs> I'm not even sponsored or anything, I just really f with Olive Garden. <laughs> the next day in class, the fairy godmother calls the parents of the descendants. Everyone seems pretty fed up with their parents, and by everyone I mean just Mal and Carlos because Evie and Jay don't even talk to their parents. Also, Jay's dad once again seems genuinely happy to see his son. While it's quite obvious that Maleficent just sees Mal as a means to an end to getting the wand. Carlos also pops off at his mom for telling him that dogs suck. Now personally, my mom would have beat my ass if I said some like that to her face. So you know if she's actually evil, his head is gonna be on a pike when he gets back to the Island of the Lost. The kids hatch a plan to grab the wand and take it back to the Island of the Lost, which involves knocking out the driver and stealing the magic limo. Super niche reference time, does anyone remember that live action Thomas the Tank Engine movie with the Magic Railroad adequately titled Thomas the Tank Engine and the Magic Railroad? Yeah, this is what the bridge reminds me of. Also, leave a comment if you would watch a review for this movie, because when I had to go watch the movie to get the footage for this bit, it reminded me of how f***ing absurd this movie is. You know what, just leave a comment if you've seen the movie, because I need to talk to someone about this. This movie was actually crazy. Anyway, back to the movie I've been talking about for 20 minutes. Everyone seems pretty iffy about whether or not they should go through with their evil nefarious plans. Mal has so much torment in her soul that she finds it necessary to sing for literally four lines and then we cut to the next scene where Ben jerks himself off about his own coronation. Oh my holy f it's a doo-wop rendition of Be Our Guest. How did they manage to not f this up? Like on paper, this should suck, right? But but this shit up, they cooked. Oh my God, this shit goes hard. Unfortunately, God's grace has limits and the song only lasts about a minute and 55 seconds. Ben introduces his parents to his new girlfriend who is of course, Mal. I imagine they'd be just as supportive about this if he brought home a black girl. In the next scene, Mal meets Sleeping Beauty's mother. Okay, I have nothing against race swapping like nine times out of 10 because usually race is just a thing that exists and doesn't actually change a character. Of course, there are times when it's odd, Ooh. But to me, it's kind of weird how all but like three of the main characters who have in every iteration of these characters been white are now some other race. At first I was like, okay, yeah, no, that's fine. But now it just feels like they're trying to hit some sort of diversity quota. If they cast it from the ground up, like if they gave these actors a script and didn't tell them who it was and they didn't have a race in mind, that's one thing. But it seems odd to me that the evil queen, Cruella DeVille and Sleeping Beauty are all people of color in this universe. This of course is just more food for thought than anything else. I'm not actually upset about this. It was just kind of a thing that I noticed. Of course, I don't have a problem with people of color being in movies. I myself am of the caramel complexion but I do think it's something that I just noticed while watching. Everyone begins to antagonize the descendants and Evie ends up putting Chad to sleep because Jay wanted to throw hands and rightfully so. Also, the dad is kind of just unjustly cold in saying this. This isn't their fault. It's yours. And you thought Maleficent was a bad mom. It's one thing to say it, it's another thing to say it and then walk away without offering any advice or guidance to the dude who is literally going to be king in 24 hours. Doug wants to go talk to Evie, but Chad shuts that sh down because he talks really f loud. And Doug is a pussy. Jane trash talks Mal and she undoes her hair. And because all of the women in this universe are shallow, they back off when Mal threatens to undo theirs as well. Also, in case you're wondering if they're morally gray or obligated to do this, I'd like to remind you that their entire plan still hinges on the fact that Ben was drugged into loving Mal. Yes, I said drugged. What do, you, what do you want me to say? Potion? Anyway, we get a group shot here and we have now arrived at Coronation Day and the parents are tuning in live. 
It was also stated earlier in the movie that they don't even have Wi-Fi in the Island of the Lost, but they do have Spectrum, apparently. On the carriage to the coronation, Mal gives Ben the anti-love potion muffin for him to eat after they've already stolen the wand. I think if someone gave me a single tiny muffin, I would also be mad. I need like three of these things to feel any sort of satisfaction. Ben also then reveals that he's known about the love potion ever since he went swimming in the Enchanted Lake and the spell washed off. Ben just figured that Mal gave him the potion because at the time he was with Audrey and she was too afraid to ask for herself. So wait a second, this dude didn't bother to do anything to mend the relationship with the girl he cheated on, even though he did it under the effects of a spell. Bro showed no remorse to Audrey for the fact that he publicly humiliated her by um, announcing that he was taking Mal to the coronation by way of singing the hardest song in the whole damn movie. The thought never once crossed his mind to correct these actions in any way, shape, or form. No. That aside, Ben says he's known he's been under the effect of the love potion for a while, but it never changed how he actually felt about her. Bro fell in love with Mal after having two very short conversations in two very public settings. That is actually wild. Also, remember how disappointed Ben's parents seemed to be in the last scene? No? Well, apparently neither do they, because this all seems to be water under the bridge for them. The coronation begins, and Ben gets his comically large crown, but it seems Mal is having doubts. But not for long, as someone then steals the wand as Ben is being sworn in. But judging by the fact that they don't show who's holding the wand, I'd imagine it's not Mal or any of the important characters who are doing this. Whoever is wielding the wand breaks the barrier that prevents magic from being used, and Maleficent takes the opportunity to turn into a fart cloud and use some not-so-instant transmission to the uh, somewhere. But during Maleficent's comically long teleportation, Mal steals the wand back from Jane who took the wand because she wanted to use it to give herself plastic surgery. Seriously, wow, that is a depressing ex machina. Has no one once told this girl that she's even kind of attractive? But Mal takes the wand and her friends come to back her up. Also, everyone is acting like she's holding a loaded gun. But I mean, to be fair, this thing could probably do considerably more damage than a semi-automatic. But Mal has conflicting feelings and says that she wants to be good and has a really long monologue about all the things that make the group really happy. Like how Carlos actually loves dogs, how Evie wants to be smart and not treated like a bimbo, and how Jay isn't actually a kleptomaniac. By the way, when I said that earlier, I was entirely serious. He actually meets the DSM-5 qualifications for being a kleptomaniac. Although the monologue is cute, I still do want to point out the fact that she's still holding the magic equivalent to a nuclear warhead. But the group does a five-way fist bump, so that's all that really matters. But just then, Maleficent finally makes her way to the coronation and forces everyone to do the mannequin challenge a year before it was even cool. Mal confronts her mom about what she really wants, but you know what this movie says? Who the f did Maleficent f I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but she did f someone. And it's never stated in the movie who that is. Which I wouldn't be pointing out if it wasn't both a central theme of this movie and the main plot point of the movie is falling in love. Which is usually something that people do before they procreate. Although I guess if we're being fair, these guys probably would have children without falling in love. But not Jafar. This is the type of man who would sing to his wife after a night of passion, and I don't give a f what you guys think, that's my headcanon. Mal uses a really simple spell that somehow works to get the wand back into her hand. Wait, no, no, holy shit, this movie ends with a CGI monster fight? Really? I know this is like Maleficent's whole thing, but wasn't I just watching a nigga play lacrosse like 30 minutes ago? This movie just gave no real build up or has any indications that Maleficent has powers even anywhere near this, so it feels like she just kind of pulled this out of her ass. Evie uses Krillin's solar flare to blind Maleficent, and as soon as she gets her vision back, Mal challenges Maleficent to a staring contest. I really wish I was making this shit up, but I'm not exaggerating. It. it is quite literally the best explanation that I can give you as to what the absolute f is happening right now. Losing the staring contest causes Maleficent to shrink to the size of the love in her heart, and Mal gives the fairy godmother her magic wand back. The fairy godmother unfreezes everyone, and Mal and Ben get their happy ending. In case you're wondering what punishment Jane gets for nearly damning the entire kingdom to years of slavery and hard labor because she wanted a nose job, I'd like to remind you that she is still white. I love you, but you are on a major timeout. So, none. There's no punishment. Audrey and Mal also make up? Why? 
They actually did nothing but be dicks to each other for the entire movie, so what is the point of this? I do think they deserve a resolution, but I think if they like begrudgingly nodded at each other, it would make a lot more sense for their characters. It would also nicely set up for a sequel a lot better than what seems to be the entirety of their relationship just being repaired. But we get one last song, dance, and celebration to take us home, and it's pretty textbook. There's nothing really to write home or mention about this song specifically. Well, actually, I do want to mention the fact that Doug can actually f*** it up quite well. Like, seriously, White Boy got the group. Also, they do the Disney Channel original movie thing here, and I feel like I need to point it out to make fun of the fact that the main characters don't kiss in DCOMs, even though they have literally already declared their love for one another. Like, come on! What the f*** is this, Doc? What the f*** is the point of this? Does Mal watch Girl Defined in her free time or something? Just kiss him, goddammit! There's also a sequel tease here. You didn't think this was the end of the story. Did you? And yes, I actually did think that this was the end of the story because every plotline got wrapped up in a neat little bow. What the f*** was I supposed to expect, Mal? But God puts his iPad back in sleep mode and the movie ends. There's also the end credits and it makes this movie feel like a 70s sitcom. Seriously, what the f*** even is this font? It's not technically important, but this font feels wildly out of place to the rest of the movie. You know, in all honesty, after watching Zombies, I didn't exactly go into this movie with an open mind. I'm a big enough man to admit that I went into this movie biased, and I feel like that was also fair because I got so many comments on the Zombies video telling me that Descendants was just as bad or worse in different ways, but honestly, that's not really the impression I got from this movie. I'm sure I could look into how problematic this is a lot more. I mean, the Beauty and the Beast tried to practice eugenics on evil people, and that is pretty messed up. But after that, I don't know if there's anything nearly as morally reprehensible outside of maybe Mal's plan revolving around the fact that she needed to drug someone? I mean, I was pleasantly surprised by the music in this movie. Y'all know that I haven't been a huge fan of the music in these movies so far, but these were all straight bangers. Honestly though, Rotten to the Core, which is kind of like the headlining song of this film, was my least favorite by a mile. I love Cameron Boyce, but it is so obvious that he's not a singer. He is in two songs in this film, and he tends to be the weakest link in both of them, but we need to remember again that he's literally three to five years younger than all of his castmates, so I'll cut him some slack on that. I'm not huge into ballads either, so the reprise of the song If Only didn't do it for me, neither did the original song. Although I'm aware for all intents and purposes it is a good song, it just kind of sounded generic to me. I think that Evil Like Me, Did I Mention, and Be Our Guest were probably the highlights of the movie for me, probably in that order. Overall, I give the music in this movie a 9 out of 10. As for the rest of the movie, it was kind of just okay, but let's just go one thing after the other. Firstly, the casting characters and acting. I think the casting was great. Once again, and for the last time, I would really have casted someone older to play Carlos Deville, as he just feels really out of place a lot of the time. It might have just been to give Carlos the younger brother feel, which I completely understand, but hold on to that thought for just a moment and I'll get back to you on why I don't really think that works in this movie. I actually think that all of the villains were cast perfectly. I think that they're all fun and kind of goofy, which I really enjoy. I still wish Jafar had a different design, but he was still such a fun character. I also think that the evil queen kind of fell into the background a lot. She has very few lines, and I think it's because she has no real discernible personality. They just make her obsessed with makeup. I don't necessarily hate that, but it comes off as lazy writing to me. The actors for The Descendants also do really well. They do amazing jobs portraying the characters they're supposed to. My problem with The Descendants is Jay and Carlos don't really matter. I'm 100% serious when I say that you could remove them from the movie, rewrite Evie just a bit, and you'd end up with somewhere near the same movie with less clutter. I loved Carlos and Jay. They have great chemistry, and like I said earlier, I like that Carlos is kind of like the group's younger brother of sorts. But none of that matters because the existence of Jay and Carlos don't matter. They serve as examples of the abuse and neglect that they received as children, but not only do we never see that, but none of the kids are anywhere near as neglected as Mal herself. This comes largely from the fact that Mal is the only character to have a real relationship with their respective parent in this movie. We see a snippet of Evie, Carlos, and Jay interacting with their parents, but the only reason that we think they're bad parents is because the movie tells us that they're bad parents. I mean, the movie quite literally tells us that they don't love them. They had to tell us that. This isn't to say that the villains aren't terrible parents or bad people, it's just that it's not really shown to us. It's the basic principle of show don't tell. For example, we're told that Jafar never loved Jay, but more than once we're seeing that Jafar is just happy to have his son around. 
We're told that Cruella lied to Carlos about dogs, which yes is true, but that's literally it. We get nothing else for their entire relationship except for the fact that Cruella lied about dogs. Which also does make a moderate amount of sense when you consider her backstory. Not saying that it's an excuse, but I'm saying that it makes sense that she'd inflate the danger of dogs and her entire backstory is that she was defeated by them. The point I'm trying to make here is that Jay and Carlos don't have anywhere near the same sad tragic backstories that Evie and Mal do. Their story beats are also just not important as well. This is the complete list of everything important that either of them does. Jay touches the force field. Cool, that increases the movie's runtime and could have been done by Evie. Carlos likes dogs now. We just discussed why that doesn't matter and it's a self-serving storyline. It doesn't have anything to do with the plot of the movie. Jay and Carlos play sport ball. Okay, great. Why? Like, I love these characters, but they don't really do anything. Enough bitching about that, though. I think all the characters do have good scripts, though. None of the dialogue was really groan-worthy or made me want to punch my screen, so I think that's worth a little bit of a thumbs up. The script is also really good at keeping the characters consistent without having them all just be cliches or stereotypes. I also really like the set designs of this movie. They're pretty creative and fun, and they actually feel like real places while still managing to feel like they still have some whimsy and spectacle that you expect in a fantasy world. This movie was also a lot more liberal with its camera work than a lot of the other Disney Channel movies we've seen on the channel. It's not spectacular, nothing too creative, but they do get some good wide shots and angles that I like. They don't just keep the camera static on characters' faces, which I appreciate. But let's go ahead and give this movie a critical score. For Descendants, I'm feeling a solid 7.5 out of 10. I don't really have that many issues with this movie, it's just pretty standard across the board. I think that this movie has some great music, creative sets, and fun characters, but the story is shaky, two of the main characters are entirely superfluous, and the writing of this movie in terms of dialogue is just entirely generic. So ultimately, I think that this movie ends up being a little better than average, but it's just not the best thing ever. But I still had a lot of fun with it. Speaking of fun, I want to give this movie a 9 out of 10 on the fun score. It's very easy to just sit down and enjoy. There's not really much more I can say than that. I feel like everything that I need to gush about, I've already gushed about, mainly being the music and the characters being fun. This movie is definitely worth a watch if you have a free afternoon. Like I said earlier, I'm sure I could point out all the glaring flaws in the terms of the morality and ethics of what this movie says with its metaphors, but I think I'll try to touch on that later in more of the Descendants 2 and 3 videos, because a lot of the comments I seem to be getting are, as the movies progress, it gets worse, so I'll touch on it more in the second and third movies. But in my opinion, there wasn't really too much to dwell on here, but feel free to leave your own interpretations in the comments, because I would like to hear what you guys have to say about that. Let me know what I should be looking out for in the second and third movies as well, and try to do it in a spoiler-free way if you can. I feel like I write better videos when I go in blind, so please try to avoid spoilers if you can. Thank you guys so much for watching this week's video. Uh, next week, I'm hoping you'll watch Hoodwinked, a movie that just kind of feels like a hallucination to me. So stay tuned for that. Thank you guys for the constant support as well. Make sure you follow my socials, join the Discord if you're into that. We're up to 140 people at the time of writing the script. And I think that's pretty cool. So you should join because when we hit 200 members, we will have 200 members. Also, I'm thinking about doing a giveaway for 50k and 100k subs. I think I might do something like a Nintendo Switch. So feel free to subscribe so we can get to do that. Me, Nathan, and Kennedy are going to get started on watching Hoodwink now. Th though, who the f*** is that? really want to think about the implications of Nathan having a daughter, so I'm just, I'm just going to put the outro here.